where others recoil in disgust, you see the true foundation of the material plane. Where others scream in terror, you see those who keep all life going. The things that send others running away reveal to you the true balance and order of the universe. The Swarm Keeper Ranger is another subclass from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything that I really feel like does an excellent job of infusing its flavor all the way through its mechanics, even down to the spell choices that you get in addition to the normal ranger spells because of this subclass. It's one that really stands out to me, and I didn't realize it when I did my review of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. It wasn't until I really got into the subclass to research it for this video that it truly revealed how well thought out all of this was. Thank you all so much for coming to another video from the Geek Pantheon. I am Eric, and today, as you probably guessed, we are going to be talking about the Swarm Keeper Ranger. Now, a quick shout out to Jaden Lustra for commenting on one of the videos asking that I do a deep dive on this one. If you would like to see your comment featured and me take a look at a subclass that you want to see, be sure to leave it down in the comments below. So, yeah, like I was saying, the Swarm Keeper Ranger, I think, does a wonderful job of maintaining its flavor all the way throughout the leveling of the subclass. I think it was well thought out. I think every choice made followed up on the intention behind it. And so like we do on these subclass deep dives, I'm gonna break down every level, every class feature, and in this case, every spell that you get, how I think it reinforces the subclass and just give my general thoughts. And then we'll get into how to play this subclass, types of parties this subclass can fit well in and how to DM for it later on. Now, the third level class feature is Gathered Swarm. So obviously you've started to gather a swarm of insects around you. There is a rollable table or just a general list of what your swarm could look like. But in addition to the striking visual of being surrounded by insects, you do get some mechanical benefits as well. Whenever you successfully land an attack on an enemy, your swarm can assist you in one of the following ways, either doing an additional 1d6 piercing damage from your swarm, you can force the target to make a strength saving throw, and if they fail, they are moved 15 feet horizontally, or the swarm can move you five feet horizontally. Now, looking at the rules as written, I don't see anything that makes me feel like this would prevent an attack of opportunity. So if you were to hit and then try to move away, I think the enemy could still use their reaction to hit you. I may be wrong there, but that's just based on my reading. And then the two spells that you get at third level for this subclass is firstly the Mage Hand Cantrip. Obviously, when you're talking about flavoring this one for this subclass, a bit of your swarm goes out and manipulates the door handle, lifts the keys, whatever you would normally be doing with the Mage Hand Cantrip, that happens. And yeah, I, I really like this. As soon as I saw that they had Mage Hand as the cantrip that you got for this subclass, I started to get excited about the other choices they were going to be making as I went on because the visual and how you can reflavor these spells to not do anything mechanically different, but just look to fit with this subclass, it was really great. And then the actual spell that you get at third level is Fairy Fire. Fireflies, a part of your swarm, go out there, read the target in light. Yeah, I mean, you would obviously want to flavor this as part of your swarm going out there and enveloping the target, making it easier for others to hit and casting light in some way. Fireflies is what came to mind for me. And before we move on, if you are enjoying this video, please be sure to give it a like and subscribe to the channel. It really does help out. We just recently broke a thousand subscribers. Thank you to all of you who have subscribed to help us reach this milestone. And we're not done there. We're hoping to continue to grow the channel. Big thank you to all of you who have subscribed. And those of you who are watching who haven't, it's free. Go ahead and subscribe and uh, continue to enjoy the videos. And if you would like to talk to me about this in real time, get my thoughts on the subclass or just D&D in general, I do stream on Twitch every Sunday and Tuesday starting at 8 p.m. Central and at 7 a.m. on Saturdays for you early birds out there. Come on by, hang out. We would love to have you in chat and let's talk. And then at fifth level, we get another spell web. This is one of the two spells that you get that's just kind of like, of course, of course you would have to put this in this subclass. Spiders, silkworms, whatever you want to be part of your swarm that generates a web. But yeah, I mean, I feel like this one doesn't require a whole lot of explanation as to how it would work from a flavor standpoint. You send the spiders out, they create the web, 
and you're good. Now at seventh level, you get Writhing Tide. This allows you to coalesce your swarm underneath your feet and have them lift you in the air, granting you a flying speed of 10 feet, and you can hover for one minute or until you are capacitated. And you can use this feature uh, a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and then it all recharges after a long rest. So yeah, I mean, this, this is great. It's showing a further level of control over your swarm, allowing them to either, like I said, coalesce under your feet and lift you up or just grab onto you and lift you up and allow you to fly and hover and float uh, above the battlefield. I think that's really cool. I enjoy it a lot. And yeah, I think getting a flying speed at seventh level isn't too horribly overpowered and it is pretty well balanced by the fact that it's only 10 feet. At ninth level, you get another spell, Gaseous Form. So when I saw this one, I thought, oh, so you're becoming part of the swarm. You can actually have the swarm envelop you and then you dissipate within it, which plays into a class feature that you get down the road that kind of beefs up the idea of Gaseous Form, but we'll get to that when we get to that. With Gaseous Form, obviously you're limited in your movement, uh, but you do get kind of that, uh, all the benefits of Gaseous Form being this almost incorporeal being. So yeah, I think this is really cool. It shows a level of integration with the swarm that I don't think a whole lot of people expected when you first started reading this, either now or when it was in Unearthed Arcana. But yeah, getting this kind of supernatural, almost like a mummy type figure from the Brendan Fraser movies where you literally become the swarm and fly out. And then at 11th level, we have Gathered Swarm Improvements, where the extra D6 of damage you could do before is now a D8. If you actually force the target to move because they failed the strength uh, saving throw, they are not prone. And then if you have the Swarm move you, you get half cover until the start of your next turn. So this does kind of stop the, uh, the frequency of the opportunity attacks, the likelihood that they're going to hit by granting you that half cover so you can use it to kind of get out of the way if that's what you want to use it for. At 13th level, you gain the spell Arcane Eye. And yeah, I mean, I once again, it kind of continues to play into that idea of you becoming part of the swarm. And I think it would be interesting to have some physical transformation start to happen probably around the time that you get Gaseous Form where you, you are becoming more insect-like or becoming just part of the swarm, as as I just said. But with Arcane Eye using that as you send a member of the swarm out to plant itself on a wall and you can see through its eyes and observe things through it. I, I think that's a really inventive use of the Arcane Eye spell and I really like that they included it here because like I've been saying, it shows that they thought all of this through and looked at spells that may normally not be associated with a subclass that can command insects, but thought, how can we take this stuff and reflavor it to work in a really cool and interesting way? And I think they accomplished that really well with the Arcane Eye spell choice here. And at 15th level, you get Swarming Dispersal. So this one's super cool, and I think kind of the final evolution form of the gaseous form that we saw earlier in this subclass, where when you take damage, using your reaction, you can gain resistance to that damage, and then use your swarm, you literally disperse into your swarm and teleport 30 feet away, showing up within your swarm at your desired location. I think this is super cool. I think gaining resistance is really interesting. And I like that it's triggered when you take damage. So you know, okay, it's not like when an enemy attacks you and you feel like you might waste it. Like when you are taking damage, you can use this uh, with your reaction if you haven't used it yet. And you can use this a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus. All of the uses recharge on a long rest. So yeah, I, I like that this kind of is an evolution. I know I talk about that a lot when I talk about subclasses, but I really appreciate when there are elements of the subclass that show not just that you're gaining more abilities, but that the things you were able to do are becoming more powerful. And I really think that the through line is there with Swarming Dispersal. And finally, at 17th level, you gain the final spell of the subclass. And kind of like Web, I don't feel like this one requires a whole lot of explanation. Insect Plague. Yeah, you have full command over your swarm. You can send them out uh, to attack using them on the offensive as opposed to a lot of these abilities being more defensive. So I really love this spell choice. It's kind of obvious and obvious like uh, capstone for this subclass, but it's simple. Why wouldn't you go with that? Okay, now let's talk about playing this subclass. What attributes I think could come to the forefront 
in role playing and flavoring a character that takes the Swarm Keeper Ranger subclass. I think first off, looking at a character that finds an appreciation and a love for things that others would find repulsive or disgusting, seeing value in all creatures, in all aspects of life, I think is a really interesting trait to give a Swarm Keeper Ranger because they are dealing with things that the common folk are going to find troublesome and, and gross, if, especially if they're using things like spiders or locusts, things that a lot of people probably rightfully have issue with. But this ranger would understand their function in the ecosystem and understand their function as a part of life. And so really playing that up, I think, could make for an interesting character. Additionally, you could lean into the more meticulous and organized nature of a lot of insects and arachnids. I mean, bees, ants really come to mind as being very structured, very organized. And so that could be something that your character really wants to emulate and really finds an appreciation of like the chaos of, of the more sentient creatures, of humanoids. They're, they're chaotic. They go about and they do whatever they want without thought to the, the greater structure of the world around them. Unlike ants and bees who, who all function towards the, the hive, towards the farm, and, and always look out for each other and try to create the greatest amount of good. I think having a, a Swarm Keeper Ranger that really leans into that and you could even ha be having a political style campaign where you have this kind of radical swarm keeper ranger who's talking about the ants and the bees and how we need to emulate them. And people raise an eyebrow, but that doesn't mean that they're wrong. But overall, I think the most important aspect to keep in mind when playing a swarm keeper ranger is this idea of an appreciation for every step of the cycle of life, an appreciation for the world around them and the function that every creature in that world serves towards creating a balanced ecosystem. I think that they wouldn't be disgusted by a lot of things, maybe things that are supernatural, that exist outside the material plane, something like undead, they would find an abomination because it exists outside of that cycle of life. You are denying other creatures food sustenance by keeping this corpse out of the ground kind of thing. Or they might be against resurrection altogether. Like, no, that's not part of the order of things. You need to look at the, the the biggest good and serve that. And if that means that your time is up and it's time for you to become worm food, well, then it's time for you to become worm food. And so I think a character like that in a world that has resurrection could be really interesting. Now, in terms of parties or other subclasses that this subclass could play well with, I think obviously the first one that at least came to my mind is the Circle of Spores Druid, also from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, of having this other character that, that uses fungus and spores as a often reviled aspect of nature and using it to benefit others and understanding the function that it serves, teaming up with a Swarm Keeper Ranger, I think would create a really interesting dynamic and, and this love and appreciation for the disgusting that other people would would throw to the side. And, you know, you could throw in a Grave Domain Cleric and a Shadow Sorcerer to really have kind of an Island of Misfit Toys kind of party feel of these, these classes that are often misunderstood amongst their peers. So I think that could be a really interesting party. Also, another sorcerer that I think could play really well with the Swarm Keeper Ranger, if you're playing it this way, is the Clockwork Soul. Because once again, all about the mechanical, the order of things, uh, and understanding how the universe is supposed to function. If you have a Swarm Keeper Ranger that's looking to ants and bees as a point of inspiration for how things could operate the most efficiently and the best, I think those two subclasses would pair really well together to have these conversations about the order and structure of the of the multiverse and how humanoids largely just ruin it all the time. Okay, and when it comes to DMing for this subclass, I only have two really big points because I, I feel like this one isn't too terribly hard to DM for. It's not like a lot of other classes where they rely on external knowledge to assist them or, or anything like that, or a specific enemy type that they really want to go after. This class is much more about its allies and who it relies on as opposed to who it's trying to fight. It, on its face, obviously you could take it a lot of different directions once you actually get it on the table. But what I'm trying to say is first off, have adventures and encounters take place 
in areas where the Swarm Keeper Ranger can have cool moments of like insects coming out of the nooks and crannies and crawling up to, to summon around them and things like that. Something that's really visually evoking. I feel like if you're just in a field and the insects come, that's not as cool as if you're in like a dusty tavern or an abandoned house and you just have these these roaches and, and mites and spiders crawling out of the woodwork, literally, to come assist this ranger. And then additionally, an important thing when it comes to classes like this that rely a lot on abilities that interact with the environment a lot, whether it's forced movement of other characters, short flight abilities, or the web spell of like stopping people from moving. Those abilities are not fun if most of your encounters are taking place in a 30 foot by 30 foot square or any kind of square for that matter. Have your encounters take place in environments that are dynamic, that have places where that force movement can cause really interesting things to happen. Places where their, their ability to only fly 10 feet can be utilized really well. And make sure that they feel like their abilities are getting their chance to shine in combat. I think every encounter environment should have stuff like that peppered around, but especially if you have somebody at your table who's investing their time and leveling up through this subclass, you definitely don't want them to feel like they're not being rewarded for that choice by having very sterile, bland encounter environments all the time. You can obviously have them every now and then. If you're in a dungeon and it's just a, a rectangular room, that's fine, that happens, but don't have that be every encounter allow them to use their abilities to great effect. And what did you all think? That is the Swarm Keeper Ranger. If you found this video at all helpful, please give it a like, subscribe to the channel. There's plenty more of these coming out. We're working our way through the subclasses one week at a time. And thank you all so much for watching. I've been Eric and I will see you next time.